Kenakan adalah dua setengah insyaAllah Dato' Bisi yang ada Ok, terima kasih uh, Sound ok ya Tuan eh? Uh, terang, sangat jelas Ok, okay terima kasih Tuan Ok, sama ada kalau Dato' tak nak kamera Dia akan, akan, akan top saja lah Ok, ini ada 18 Hello everybody Nice to meet all of you. Welcome everybody to this ATU net UPF Series 2 <laughs> Okay. Cuan suara satu, dua, tiga, empat Cubaan suara satu, dua, tiga Daripada Raya PM Assalamualaikum From GTM Welcome From From Nizam From Nizam Yeah, from Nizam Okay From Rezaida is here Show yourself From Rezaida Hi, from Nizam Duduk Okay
Naskan bojo nanti. Tadi kenapa? Muka saya muka saya kau. Wih, macam-macam gadget ni. Jom. Oh. So, kat mana eh? Oh, ni santai. Oh, macam-macam kamera ni. Nampak kalau saya pegang ni nampak tak? Ini saya yang ni kami dah buat pakai slide. Oh okey. Oh ini macam budak sekolah lah ni. Okey okey. Okey cuba tengok one round. Nampak jelas tak? Nampak nampak. So yang akan kontrol nanti. Oh. Presiden ni tak Datuk Wahid ni tak, tak ni. Dia ada tak ada eh? Tak apa, tak apa. It's okay. Saya ada saya ingat kat tu. Oh, ini dah macam... Saya masuk dalam tu dalam kat sini dia presiden kan eh yeah. uh, UT chairman wahai Omar wahai Razali pula ya yeah. Oh, habis? Jangan sandar lah. Jangan, jangan sandar. Kalau duduk? Ha, itu. Okay. Okay. Kalau macam ni, okey? Itu lagi tak ada santai. Oh, bukan santai? Okey. Ini official kan? Baju sikit. Ambil baju. Okey. Dalam kamera tak nanti? Ya. Yeah. Kalau macam ni, nanti baju dia makin terangkat gini. Kalau lalu macam ni, tangan nanti terangkat. Okey. 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 Oh, aku tak boleh pegang-pegang paper lah kan?
belum-belum ni tadi saya ada edit baru baru the latest one minta Assalamualaikum Prof Zahra Welcome Prof Zahra you can uh, please unmute if you wish to speak Assalamualaikum Prof Zahra Waalaikumsalam Prof How are you? Alhamdulillah Alhamdulillah uh, Prof Wahid Razali the Vice Chancellor of UTHM is, is with me yes. Sitting next to me I don't yes. think. Yeah. Assalamualaikum, uh, Prof. Uh, Waalaikumsalam, Professor Datuk. How are you? Yeah, fine. Thank you. Thank you. For, Alhamdulillah. You know. Thank you for the kind invitation. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. We are part of ATU. Aren't you? Yes, certainly, certainly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yes. Datuk Wahid Omar, is he around? Yeah, I think he's around. Yeah. Okay, now we can see Datuk VC, okay. <laughs> yeah. Assalamualaikum and good afternoon everyone. Waalaikumsalam. Is that Prof. Wahid, uh, Datuk Wahid? Datuk Wahid Omar. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. Datuk, I need to see your face. So, I think better I put in my mute board and yeah. also video on. I yeah. Ah, all right. Okay. No problem. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Ah, yeah. 
Satya, thank you. Satu yutem pun ada juga. Satu raha, raha pun ada. Siapa lagi? Niza yutem ke?
Malaysia tu. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Salam sejahtera and a very warm welcome to all our guest speakers Our respected uh, Vice Chancellors, Deputy Vice Chancellors And all the viewers around the world This is University Tundisan on Malaysia And your host for today in this all important University Presidents Forum 2020 Series 2 Organised by Asia Technological University Network or ATU Net. For your information, Asia Technological University Network was formed in 2016 and now comprises of at least 30 university members around Asia. If you have been a viewer for UPF Forum Series 1, which was hosted by University Technology Malaysia on 15 July 2020, I am sure you have been captivated by the presentation and discussion conducted by the speakers on the theme Embracing the New Norm, Leadership, Values and Skills. Likewise, for this series too, we will have distinguished speakers who will be giving the expert opinion towards the theme of this forum entitled Building Academic Resilience in the Post-COVID-19 World. We all know that COVID-19 pandemic has impacted our daily lives, our routines have changed, and importantly, COVID-19 has also impacted the implementation of higher education around the world. And unfortunately, we are now in uncharted territory. Why? Because from a few months ago, our daily lives have, have had to change. Our normal lifestyle has changed. Social distancing, wear masks, wash hands, and worse, deserted cities are the new normal. Across the world, attempts to stop the spread of the virus causes government to implement total lockdowns or partial lockdowns. Essentially, lockdowns are to control the spread of this disease, which is important. But this action eventually causes temporary closure to schools and universities, not only in Malaysia, but around the world. But we are here not to discuss about COVID-19. We are here to discuss about how we, as academicians, students and other interested parties, to build academic resilience in this post-COVID-19 world. So friends and colleagues, how do we actually build academic resilience? What does it mean to the very people involved, either directly or indirectly, the students, the academic staffs, administrators, parents, and various stakeholders? Therefore, to help us to understand this issue and to provide better clarity, we are very fortunate to have with us a number of guest speakers who are leaders in their respective fields and organizations and who are ready to share their views, their experience towards meeting the theme of this forum. The forum will commence by a, by a welcoming speech from the Vice Chancellor of University Tun Houston on Malaysia, and this will then be followed by two keynote addresses. Yes, the, first, yes. the first keynote speaker will be yes. the Vice Chancellor of University Tun Houston on Malaysia, Yang Berbahagia Professor Datu TS Dr. Wahid bin Razali. This will be followed by the second keynote speaker, which will be delivered by the Minister of Higher Education Malaysia, Yang Berhormat Datu Dr. Noraini Ahmad. At the end of the keynote addresses, there will be a short question and answer session and this will be followed by a special engagement video presentation from the industry, community, academia and student representative. 
After the video presentation, we will then be hearing the views and thoughts from our four distinguished guest speakers. The first speaker is Professor Dr. Dayang Hajah Zohra Haji Sulaiman, the Vice Chancellor of University of Technology Brunei. The second speaker is Ms. Christine Wong Bei, Group Vice President and Head International Affairs and Government Relations, JD.com China. The third speaker is Professor Dr. Chun Fai Leong, uh, President, International Press in Association from Japan. And the fourth and final speaker will be Professor Dr. Ismail Abdurrahman, the Deputy Vice Chancellor, Academic and International of University Tun Hussein On, Malaysia. By the end of the presentation, question and answer session will follow through, where each speaker will be allocated one question each. After the session finishes, we will then witness a special launching of the ATUNet Online Global Class Classroom, or OGC. ATUNet OGC is made possible by collaboration among ATUNet members to offset the absence of physical mobility and to create opportunities for students across the network to meet online, to learn and to connect. I will then finish by making a short summary of the forum and, and closing remark, which should take us up to about 4.30 p.m. Malaysia time. Lastly, at the end of this program, Zoom viewers will have a 30-minute special engagement session with the Vice Chancellor of University Tun Hussein on Malaysia. So please join us in this special session. And I've now come to the end of my short introduction, and I would like to wish all viewers a wonderful, eventful, and fruitful time during this entire program. Thank you very much. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, without, uh, for, without any further delays, I would like to call upon Yang Berbahagia, Datuk Dr. Uh, Wahid Razali, the Vice Chancellor of University Tun Hussein on Malaysia, to give us his welcoming speech. Datuk, please. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Aziz. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh, and a very good afternoon to everyone, uh, either you are in Malaysia or elsewhere in all parts of the world. Our Honourable Keynote Speaker, Yang Berhormat Dato' Dr. Noraini Ahmad, our Minister of Higher Education, uh, all the university presidents present here today, and of course, I would like to also say thank you to the Chairman of the ATU NET, that is the Vice, Vice Chancellor of UTM, uh, Professor Dato' uh, Dr. Wahid Noma, and also uh, all the rectors that I've seen today, from Malaysia, at least five uh, vice chancellors uh, in Malaysia uh, are here together to share their views and things like that, and also rectors and presidents of ATU Net members. Ladies and gentlemen, Alhamdulillah, I think it's a great honor that uh, uh, for me to greet all of you by saying Selamat Datang and welcome to the second series of Virtual University President Forum 2020. And I would like to express my sincere thanks uh, to the team from UTHM for untiring efforts to ensure that the success of this event. Also, uh, to the ATUNET uh, Secretariat from UTM, who has helped lots with the team of UTHM in many aspects, as well as uh, given the opportunity for UTHM to host uh, this wonderful event. Thank you. UTM and thank you to Dato Wahid Omar. And this is actually the second series of the University President Forum. And the first one, as informed by the chairman just now, was UTM, was at UTM and was held on the 15th July 2020. Whilst the third one uh, will be hosted by ATUNET partner, Shibara Institute of Technology on the 17th September 
2020. And I hope that everyone of us will have time to join the third A2Net uh, seminar or meetings. As you may already know that UPF is organized for providing a platform to discuss current issues related to higher education, as well as uh, outline strategies and action plan for the future improvement of the collaboration and cooperation between participating universities in many aspects. And we are aware also that uh, the world has been astounded by the COVID-19 pandemic, which uh, we always term them as new norms. So what I can say here is the uniqueness of this UPF 2020 is the platform where everyone is, contact, is connected virtually. This is how we and other people in the world is currently and struggling, adapting, learning, nurturing, and also flourishing and cultivating the development of preservation after the COVID-19. Whether we survive or not, that depends so much on how much we work and how much we collaborate with one another. And it is undeniable that there is opportunity in every difficulty and therefore we should be moving forward together and find creative and innovative ways and means, particularly in building academic resilience. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of UTHM, I would like again to thank the Minister of Higher Education for having time with us and also UTM for you know, uh, leading these uh, programs. And again, uh, please enjoy the afternoon and I hope that every one of us will enjoy the session and for the good and benefit of uh, respective universities. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. Thank you very much, Yang Berapa Gia Datuk, uh, Vice Chancellor of University of Tunis Alam Malaysia, uh, for giving us your welcoming speech. I am sure that the audiences will be very keen to be to listen and to sh and to learn uh, from this uh, forum about how we can build academic resilience uh, through this post-COVID-19 and the sharing of different experiences from our speakers will also, I'm sure, benefit all the audiences uh, today. So uh, now we'll come to the keynote address and, uh, and the keynote address, the first keynote address will be delivered by our beloved uh, Datuk Vice-Chancellor, uh, Professor Datuk T.S. Dr. Wahid bin Razali. Now, before I ask him to deliver his uh, keynote address, uh, allow me to read his uh, bio data. <coughs> okay, um, uh, Professor Dato Professor Dato T S Dr Wahid bin Razali, he is a specialist in the field of TVET or TVET Curriculum and Engineering Education. He started his. Uh, study in civil engineering and obtained his PhD in engineering education from University of Manchester, United Kingdom in 2000. He has particip participated actively in professional bodies such as Board of Engineers Malaysia and Malaysia Board of Technologies, MBOT. He started his, his academic career as a lecturer at the Polytechnic in Kuoma in Perak in 1983. Now, uh, without any further delay, I call upon Yang berbahagia Datuk to deliver his keynote address. Okay. Datuk, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Prof Aziz, for letting me, instead of the minister first, as the minister I think is still in the parliament now, uh, busy with the question and answers, and therefore uh, she will come after my slot. Um, I think the basic idea of why resilience is so important is because that everybody is talking about it. So we talk about resilience with respect to how can we survive during the time of this pandemic. And it's important that as higher education, we understand the whole situation in hands. Perhaps let me have a look first into what is, or as for yesterday, that about 20 million of coronavirus cases. And mind you that it may involve some of our students, 
some of our learners, some of our teachers, some of our lecturers, and perhaps uh, our relative. But about 1.3 billion basically are affected by this. And out of that, 70% of the total enrolled learners. Take example from Malaysia that when pandemic COVID-19 was, you know, uh, looming around the country. So all schools, all universities, colleges or polytechnics will have got to follow the SOP, meaning that either close or we have got to somehow follow a very strict regulation and SOP by the Ministry of Health. And indeed, this is very important that university like us discuss and think of how we can move on with respect to academic excellence. And I think getting this figure from McKinsey and also uh, Bloomberg, the low skill jobs in market are at risk of automation, or in other words, are at risk of losing their jobs. So these are mainly uh, those in the frontliners, those involved with the real you know, uh, communication or meeting with people. And, and the least perhaps uh, to have the job loss is of those involved, like IT managers and so on. So these are important for us to have uh, some understanding of uh, why that today uh, I'm suggesting that uh, the issue of TVET should be put forward as an important agenda for, of the country, at least in Malaysia. Next, please. And coming from the point of view of what do we do, perhaps let me just explain a bit that when we talk about resilience, it's about being able to follow through the adversity. And in this, con in this context, I feel that uh, pandemic COVID-19 is an adversity by itself. And how do you mediate, mediate the processes so that we could have a better expected outcomes than what we are having now? So this is by definition is what I understand by resilience. And therefore, resilience is a process. Resilience also is a multi-level, which means that it has got to follow through from the top, from the Ministry of Higher Education or Ministry of Education, and then to the universities or schools, and also to individual uh, learners and also families. And these, the multi-levels uh, mediating processes have got to be you know, uh, strengthened so that on the whole, the country will be able to position itself to have a better than expected outcomes. I think all of you would agree with me if I say that uh, pandemic or COVID-19 is uh, it is guising as pandemic, but at the same time, it provides us with some good experiences that improve our life in many ways. That, you know, uh, suddenly we realize that how much we can do that we could not or we refused to do in the past. So these are part of uh, the thing that, you know, as outcomes of pandemic. So not everything that COVID-19 or the virus brought to us is good or is bad. And more, more things are coming up in the form of, you know, understanding in the form of practices. So this is actually what we need to discuss at the higher education. Okay, how can we move on with respect to education? Next, please. I think to start off, let me begin is what is the attributes or new capabilities within the range of time that we are having now. The, con uh, the COVID-19 in the midst of po uh, COVID-19, also post-COVID-19. Definitely that if we look around, that we need to have people who can expand the ability to operate in a fully digital environment. 
We also need people or students who can develop skills to ensure that they are critical and they are able to redesign and also innovate. And thirdly, it must be strengthening of social and emotional skills to ensure effective collaboration. And of course, the point that we are discussing today is that how that one, in the midst of COVID-19, could build up adaptability and resilience skills to thrive during evolving in a business situation. So these are, I guess, not a new thing, but additional thing that we must provide uh, to our students or our graduates. Okay, next please. And there are lots of challenges, and of course, but under the leadership of uh, Dato, uh, Dr. Noraini, uh, the Minister of Higher Education, that uh, Tibet has been placed into a role that is greater or more than before. For example, that all along, that the Ministry of Educa Higher Education have initiated about 29 initiatives. I would like just to quote uh, one initiative, that is number 26. That every university or colleges must provide flexible education and digitalization of education, which means urban university or how to urbanize our education. The idea of making sure that CBE or competency based education, making sure that uh, everything is stackable by having micro credential or having a credit transfer all around, making sure that there is what we call holistic assessment and also having the opportunity to practice what we call blended learning and or open and distant learning. So my colleague, uh, Professor Smail, will talk a little bit more on what would be the initiative at the university level. And not only that, but I think the ministry is also concerned with what would happen to our graduates. So yearly, there are about, uh, perhaps, about 300,000 graduates. So which means that we have got to take care of the jobs. So, and still that the Minister of Higher Education have embarked on what we call uh, upskillings of our graduates. I guess, and perhaps uh, the minister would announce uh, in a bit later that uh, a new initiative for this. Uh, I hope so, inshallah. Okay, next please. And rethinking about the reshaping of the Tibet talent, I guess that the key element of Tibet, that is learning, work, and technology. If you ask me uh, which of the following three uh, what we call triangle has the least movement of change in the last a few decades. I guess it would be the learning. The learning has a lot to move and the learning has a, has a lot to change. And only this learning that together with the good practices of work and technology would be able to shape the right talents for the industries. And therefore, I think the role of a university as a whole is not to isolate learning from the technology and not to isolate learning from the work. This is a very important thing that this is how the perspective of TVET trainer is. Meaning that these three elements must get together. And of course, Coming from the background of, uh, you know, uh, competency-based education, what is important is that we need to address this few future learning trust that is experiential, that we should be able to provide experience to our learners. The theme, technology, flexibility, student-centeredness, collaboration, engagement, and creativity so these are, to my opinion, is a simple, and this is not at the end of you know, the list, but at least 
that in the midst of COVID-19 or post-COVID-19, we must remember that we have jobs to do and the industries have got jobs to do, but experiential learning, despite the fact that you know, COVID-19 forbids people from in, you know, uh, communicating and also collaborating within close proximity where learning should happen. But I guess we need to find ways how we could address this issue of experiential uh, or having doing the element of being. Because I believe sincerely that without doing, I wouldn't like to call you an expert. Without having to do things, then I wouldn't like to say that you are good at it. And therefore, as a TVET institution, I think the idea of how to make, uh, how to shape the talent so that they are experiential in nature, at the same time, they are also adaptable and also resilient is a very important question that every one of us will have got to answer. Next, please. And the challenge is, how can we move from the conventional TVET that we are having now, as in, in the slide there, and into the new TVET that we should be doing? How much is the gap between the conventional and also the new TVET? So this is a bit of an issue that we need to address. However, I would like just to provide uh, perhaps very conceptual understanding of how we should do this. Next, please. And most of the time that previously that we are focusing on the practicals and of course a little bit on the virtuality that we are on the left side of the graph. But in the midst of COVID-19, I guess that we have got to work out what could we do as lecturers and students to have the mixed reality activities within uh, our curriculum. So perhaps this is the challenge as well as the potential of TVET in the future. And for that, I guess that it would be future-oriented, cost reduction, the scalability and also shareability. Therefore, I would like to urge uh, universities to share as much as UTHM is sharing uh, the online courses, MOOC to everyone of us. But for TVET purposes, where we need to use our hands and perhaps some other physics to do work, then perhaps practical things or really doing things is still a very important aspect of our activities. And if we can do that, then pre-lab and also augmented reality would be the next better things. And if nothing cannot be provided for, then perhaps virtual reality is our next move to that. So perhaps, so this is, uh, you know, uh, the thing that we should be moving on. And in the midst of those, that I would like to have a thought on this and, and provide some, some form of framework that how we should go about it. But I always believe that technology is, is a matter of, you know, choice. You can have a low and high technologies. You can have a pen and pencil, but you can have the whole virtual lab to yourself. However, important is that the core, the thinking and the doing must be there. I will not have time to elaborate on this, what do I mean by digital TVET learning society framework, but I guess that uh, the first thing that we need to do is that to be able to digitalize everything that we would like to consider as content into uh, the cloud and also into the digital format before we can do much. And with that, I guess uh, I would like to, you know, uh, leave it to the floor uh, to think for yourself and to register your disagreement with me if you disagree. And, and, and please, uh, everything uh, should start from, you know, ideas and we discuss and I hope that this platform of ATUNet would be able to come up with something for our own goods and our respective universities or, or the CEOs of universities' uh, uh, future. So thank you very much, and I hope that uh, you will have more to say after this. Thank you, Prof. Thank you, Dato, for the excellent speech.
and the sharing of your ideas about TVET and the uh, possible ways that TVET will contribute towards higher education post-COVID-19 in the context of Malaysia or even around the world. So I can just touch a bit about what you have mentioned. You have mentioned a few very important points uh, in your speech just now, Dato. Uh, one of the first points I, I, I gather was the academic resilience that you touched. Uh, and you mentioned that academic resilience is a process, which is rightly so because it is a long process and it involves a lot of, uh, it is sort of a multi-level tasking. Yeah. Various organizations are involved in making sure that academic resilience will be covered throughout uh, everybody concerned. Secondly, that we have touched on the people skills, which is also very, very vital in this post-COVID-19 uh, pandemic situation where we need people to improve their skills uh, towards the, the digital environment that we have now. And then, Yang uh, Berapa you also touched on the matter of flexible education and the digital, digitalization of education, which is necessary as what we have now been facing uh, in, in, a, in this uh, COVID-19 situation. And, uh, and finally, I would like to say that you have touched about the experiential learning, uh, which is a very important aspect of TVET, because for conventional TVET, you need to touch and hold things. This is part of the conventional TVET. But now, with due to the COVID-19 situation, what do we do next? So I think that to have thrown us uh, a few questions to all of us to ponder. And he did touch on one aspect of how we can overcome this situation is about virtual reality. So this is something that we can think about. So thank you very much, Datuk, for this excellent speech. I'm sure all of us have, uh, have uh, you've given us a lot of thoughts to think about uh, during this afternoon session. So now we come to the second keynote uh, uh, speaker, which is our uh, Minister of Higher Education, Yang Borhamad Datuk Dr. Noraini Ahmad. And uh, is the video so without any delay i would like to uh, invite yang uh, yang berhormat dr noraini ahmad to give us her keynote address good afternoon and assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh first and foremost i would like to express my fullest gratitude to the Asia Technological University Network, or ATUNET, chaired by Professor Dato Insinyur Dr. Wahid Umar, the Vice Chancellor of University of Technology Malaysia for organizing this event. I would also like to con congratulate the chairman for the current event, uh, Professor Dato Dr. Wahid Razali, the Vice Chancellor of University Tun Hussein on Malaysia, and all his team members for the successful and beneficial event. Last but not least, to all invited speakers, Professor Dr. Dayang Haja Zohra Haji Sulaiman, the Vice Chancellor of University Technology Brunei, Ms. Christine Wong, Group Vice President and Head, International Affairs and Government Relations of JD.com, China, Professor Dr. Chun Fai Leung, President International Pressing Associations, Japan, and Professor Dr. Ismail Abdurrahman, Deputy Vice Chancellor, Academic and International, University Tun Hussein on Malaysia, all Vice Chancellors and Presidents and all participants in this event. I am so pleased to be invited as keynote speaker in this Atunet Virtual University Presidents Forum 2020 Series 2. On behalf of the Ministry of Higher Education, we are very happy uh, to have this event organized in Malaysia with the participation of various universities from all over the world. As we all know, COVID-19 has changed our education landscape in many aspects. We are now able to communicate with anyone 
without being or attending physically. Therefore, there is no excuse for not to be able to talk or collaborate between universities in the world as I speak. A new normal or collaboration can now be done anywhere, anytime, and can be done quickly. So ladies and gentlemen, prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, we have been in good track in our Malaysian educational blueprint, higher education 2015, 2025. The MEB, higher education, outlines 10 shifts that have spurred continued excellent in the higher education system. All 10 shifts address key performance issues in the system, particularly with regard to quality and efficiency, as well as global trends that are disrupting the higher education landscape. Under the Shift 8 Global Prominent, which is one of the shifts outlined in the blueprint, we have been striving for the encouragement and support system for all universities in Malaysia to collaborate with global universities. Therefore, I believe that this Virtual University President's Forum 2020 is in line with our expectation and then the networking between all universities involved is really important in overcoming future challenges together. In another aspect, Malaysia also committed in establishment of digital technical and vocational education and training or digital TVET for upskilling and nurturing our talents and expanding their capabilities. I am proud to share that UTHM, which is the host, is one of TVET institutions that has offered TVET program for the students. Distinguished presidents, vice chancellors, ladies and gentlemen, COVID-19 pandemic is the defining global health crisis and the greatest challenge we have faced in our lifetime. Since it emerged in Asia late last year, the virus has spread to every continent in the world and cases are rising from millions around the globe. On record, this health crisis recorded nearly 21.1 million people have been contracted the virus. However, the good news is that 12.9 million people recovered, but sadly, nearly 730,000 lives have been lost. All countries are racing and working hard to slow down the spread of the disease by testing and treating patients, carrying our contact tracing, limiting travel, quarantining citizens, and canceling events. Large gatherings, including social gatherings. In Malaysia, the government enforces lockdowns when and where it is necessary, and the Movement Control Order, or in short, MCO, which allows partial opening of essential oils and restricted movement by the people, closure of businesses, and thus causes people to lose their jobs and income with no way of knowing when normality were returned. As an example, nations heavily dependent on tourism have empty hotels and deserted beaches. It was estimated by the International Labour Organization 
that up to 25 million jobs could be lost all over the world. So ladies and gentlemen, these are some of the very dark scenarios that we are now so familiar with and often heard of or even accounted ourselves ever since the emergence of the COVID-19 pandemic. But I'm happy to say that we are here not to discuss about COVID-19, its origins, or how the virus was spread, or how to stop the spread. Let's leave that to the experts and others to discuss those issues. But of course, and no doubt, we are as important as the next person in trying to stop the spread of this disease. We are here to discuss a very important issue that is very close to all of us in the academic fraternity. What does academic resilience actually mean to all stakeholders involved, either directly or indirectly in higher education? The student, the staff, academic and administrators, parents and various stakeholders. Academic resilience refers to the ability of academicians and students alike to make the effort to succeed despite adverse circumstances by changing existing behaviors or developing new ones, such as applying new best practice adopting with new disciplines, or having a clear and concrete planning for the future. From the above statement, I can gather three key words that I will share with the viewers. The first one, planning. The second, adopting. The third one is applying. The coronavirus crisis has forced many industries to rapidly reshape how they can do their business, including the higher education sector that is facing challenges and demands operationally and financially. Malaysia, which has become an attractive study destination, can also seize the new opportunities presented from this crisis. The Ministry has recently endorsed preventive and safety measures of the new norms that higher education institutions are required to abide by concerning the management of existing and new international students entering HEI campuses. International students bring various benefits in cultural exchanges, academic and research excellence and many more. Anyhow, the flow of international students to Malaysia will most likely decrease in the fall. The coronavirus has hit all of us hard and may dissuade some international students from coming. Challenges and delays in obtaining visas in Malaysia and other parts of the world and in getting flight here threatened the enrollment of some. International students' mobility and enrollment by extension will be imparted by these new economic and political realities. Many of the forecasts about the future global students' mobility have been decreasing in their outlook. COVID-19 has forced students all over the world to rethink about their higher education choices and how they can adjust their career goals. I really hope that this event, the Asia Technological University Network or ETUNET Virtual University Presidents Forum 2020 Series 2 will bring us together in fighting and surviving the COVID-19 pandemic and make us stronger and be more prepared for any challenges that might come in the future. 
global cooperation is key in building back together post-COVID-19. With that, thank you very much. Dr. Raini for the keynote address, a very thoughtful and a very uh, strong speech by the Minister highlighting uh, the, the vast efforts by her ministry in ensuring that all the uh, higher education, especially in Malaysia, is ongoing as normal. And also in her speech, the minister has also clearly highlighted uh, her aspiration towards the important event and her expectation on the way forward for higher education uh, post-COVID-19. So, let us ensure that this event will, will, be, will deliver its objectives and meet the standards set by the Minister. So now, uh, friends and colleagues, let us proceed to the next uh, session, which is the question and answer session. So uh, what I, since uh, time is a bit uh, on the tight side now, what I will do is I will only allow one question uh, to be forwarded to our uh, Datuk Vice Chancellor, who is here with us. Uh, uh, so, can I have the question, please? Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Prof. Good afternoon. Uh, please, I am Niki. Uh, okay, please proceed. Please proceed with your question. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, we can hear you. Please. Okay. I would like to ask Prof, uh, the post-COVID-19 actually is a call for all the academics and also students to be more innovative in developing a digital interactive activity. So my question is, how do we develop soft skill of uh, students through online activities such as webinar or a segment of sharing? And the crucial part to be answered is, how do we evaluate the soft skill of students through online events? Okay, thank you very much uh, for the question. So, Datuk, would you like to respond to this question? Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Lee. I guess you are from UTHM or uh, perhaps somewhere else. Uh, this is a very tough question. Uh, that is, uh, how do we assess, evaluate the online learning? Of course, there are means and ways of assessing, but since I'm not an expert in it, perhaps some of you, uh, the, you know, the viewers, things like that, you're, you, you're an expert in it, please uh, you know, uh, give your views. And perhaps our deputy vice chancellor for academic would have some thoughts over it. However, as a personal load, uh, I've done a bit of research on uh, what we call the measurement of ethics. How do we measure ethics? So quite similarly, I think this is very uh, intrinsic things to measure. Is a very a bit of you know intangible things to measure, and therefore I think the best way to do that is uh, number one. Uh, through the peer assessments. And this is only possible if, you know, uh, there is a close interaction within the subjects, a collaboration between peers and also groups of learners. So this is, uh, you know, perhaps is half empty a solution to the question that you are putting. I'm sorry that uh, we need to put forward and perhaps our guys and our you know, researchers in, in our network will be able to answer you uh, sometime later. So I'll keep that in mind and make sure that our UNC2 will have some answers. Yeah, thank you, uh, Lee. Okay, thank you, Dr. Lee, for the question. It's a good question and a relevant question in regards to the, to the situation that we are facing now. So measuring how to assess soft skills, how to measure uh, something that we, that we cannot uh, see is, is, uh, to evaluate is very difficult. So, and uh, Dato Vaisansler has rightly said that we have, this is a process. It is, uh, we have to sit down and think on how to create a system that we can monitor or measure, uh, basically, essentially on soft skills of every student that we have. 
So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Lee, for your question. Uh, thank you, Datuk, for your answer. And uh, actually, I was told that we may have time for another question. Uh, can we have? Is it okay, Datuk? We have yeah, another yeah, sure, question. Yeah. Uh, so okay, okay, can we have the next question, please? Uh, can yes. You, um, can you mention can your? Please just say your name, please. please. Identify um, yourself. Um, this is uh, Jamal Hussein Didan uh, from FKMP UTHM. Okay. Can I direct the question to uh, our professor? Yes, yes, uh, please uh, proceed. Okay. Um, we, we all know by now that actually preparing for a pandemic outbreak on university level require multidimensional efforts by individuals experienced in the unique ways university functions. This in, may include the planning of theory, practical approaches, committee organization, community relations, and changes in development, human behavior, leadership, and emergency management. My question to our professor is how the university actually ensure the effectiveness of campus pandemic management plan. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, I think Mr. Jamal. Jamal. Jamal, yes. Mr. Jamal, yes. I think if you're a student of UTHM, I think uh, you could have some thoughts of what actually we did. And I must inform you that almost every university in Malaysia, uh, I can talk uh, basically on the, on the public universities, that we have almost similar things, meaning that safety is most important, that nothing could replace or could you know, replace life. And therefore, we take that as our number one priority. And then secondly, is about the processes of learning. So after we make sure that uh, you know, safety, health could be secured, then only then that we go to learning. Otherwise, we will not go into learning. You will have got to go into learning on your own or through learning online or virtually. So now, uh, I think this October, we are, inshallah, that we we free from uh, uh, this COVID-19 pandemic, inshallah, and we pray hard for that. And in October, we welcome everybody from the safe area to come over. And this is a time that we should manage well, meaning that all the procedure and SOP as also, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, lauded by our uh, Minister of Higher Education that must be followed through. Social distancing, I mean physical distancing, and also making sure that uh, the whole of the university is clearly free from the COVID-19. And don't worry about that. Please tell our students that we'll take care of you know, the safety of the universities from the entry point up to the exit point. And please, what we need is that everybody must, uh, by themselves or ourselves, become the defender of our own uh, community. That if you know anybody or suspects, then please inform us and we will you know, pass them on to our doctors locally or in, in our uh, hospitals here in UTHM and they will manage that. So I hope that you understood and don't worry, and if you are an international student elsewhere and you have not made a comeback, please come back. But I must assure you that please follow the SOP. Please follow the SOP of the Malaysian government, which may be different from your government or other countries. But while you're entering Malaysia, that I urge you just to follow our rules and orders for SOP. Inshallah, that everybody will be safe and happy and will be able to learn better. Thank you very much. Thank you, Datuk, for your response to the question by Dr. Jamal uh, uh, Dida. Okay, so uh, thank you very much for the question and also for the answer. I think Datuk has uh, given, us, given us the assurance that uh, UTHM uh, it's a safe, uh, co hopefully co free COVID-19 uh, area, inshallah. So we will try our best. We, will, we always follow the, the procedures as stated by the ministry and as stated by the, by the vice chancellor. Uh, all, everybody from that point of entry until you leave, 
you know, uh, everybody is safe, inshallah, in this, in, in this university. So, uh, so now, Dato, thank you very much, Dato, for, for sharing your time with us in this forum. So I am certain that audiences will have appreciated your presentation this afternoon. Your ideas and thoughts uh, will have enlightened the views of the audiences, not only in Malaysia, but also, I'm sure, viewers around the world. And uh, I have the last question, Professor. Uh, I'm, s I'm sorry, we have, to, we have to proceed with the next session. Uh, we are going to have uh, um, a special session, engagement session, after the end of, at the end of this program. So that during this session, you can always, uh, you, are, you are allowed to communicate with our Vice Chancellor. He will be present during the special engagement session. I'll be around. Yeah. Our vice chancellor will be around. He will be with, uh, in, this, in this room with, with all of us. So I must apologize uh, and, uh, because we need to proceed with the, with the program. So I hope you can bear with us and, uh, and you can, you can uh, ask the question during the special engagement session at the end of this program. Is it okay with you? Okay, thank you very much. So, uh, okay, let me... Let me uh, uh, proceed and now what we are going to do friends and colleagues uh, all over the world we are now going to view a special engagement video presentation from the community academia industry and student representative so uh, please watch and uh, let's enjoy the video Everyone affected by the pandemic COVID-19, either direct or indirect, especially for the academic world. Either you are from um, as a lecturer, either you are as a student, or you are an academic uh, provider. So we have changed dramatically from the face-to-face -face education to the everything is online. So what is we are looking for is the support system. We are looking for the, to maximize the best practice and we are looking for more uh, flexibility for the lecturer and finally we are looking for uh, to adapt uh, best practice in our own university. The government has already done a good job, the university has done their best um, to cater to the students needs and I think they are doing a really good job. But obviously in the near future, if we are having a you know, pandemic or we're having any types of other disaster, maybe there is a better solution other than online classes. Because obviously, uh, not everybody can afford you know, online classes. Not everybody can have good coverage. As you guys can see from the news, there have been university students who have to climb up trees, they have to go up to the mountains, they have to be out from their houses just to get better internet connection. So for me, from my point of view, obviously the solution has to be one of two. The first one being either the government has to make sure that everybody has uh, good Wi-Fi access, or second, there has to be a better solution than just online classes. Uh, this kind of crisis ever happening again, we should have a clear and better view and more efficient way to handle um, you know, all the things that is happening to us as students. What yang the industry harapkan daripada pihak universiti semasa COVID-19 punya uh, time eh, adalah pihak universiti dapat mengekalkan kualiti pengajaran to student lah. That mean uh, once we doing video conference, kita akan kurang hands on eh. So, kena cari universiti kita harapkan uh, expect universiti boleh find a way untuk kekalkan hands on punya training lah. Yang uh, teori ni boleh buat online semua kan, semua orang boleh buat. Kita nak kita macam cari cara yang mana kaedah ke method software ataupun uh, yalah, any how to do online punya hands on punya 
online learning Itu yang saya tak nampak lah Macam anak-anak saya pun dekat rumah Tengok uh, Assignment menambah-nambah Tengok on teori lah eh. So we hope that UTHM can cope on this On the hands on uh, Sebab UTHM terkenal dengan uh, Melahirkan graduan yang hands on lah Bukan yang usia lain lah apa yang berlaku pada masyarakat kita yakni COVID-19 yang berlaku sekarang ini walaupun kita berada di penghujung PKPP sekarang tapi satu benda pada masyarakat yang berlaku ada satu benda satu kejutan yang tak pernah berlaku sebelum ini jadi kelangsungan hidup pada masyarakat terutamanya dari segi pemakanan dan sumbangannya lah jadi satu benda yang amat oh, mengejutkan pada masyarakat jadi Apabila kita berada di tengah-tengah masyarakat yang sebelah kita ni ada Universiti Tun Sin On Malaysia, jadi kalau boleh macam mana pihak universiti boleh membantu masyarakat dalam keadaan yang satu kejutan apa kehidupan yang kita nak alami sekarang ni nak meneruskan kehidupan selepas dan waktu tu dan selepasnya. Okay, thank you, and uh, welcome back, everybody. And uh, I'm sure all of you have listened to, uh, uh, have watched the video and listened to the to the wish list by by our commentators in the, in the video. So all of them have some kind of uh, um, uh, wish that they would like to have uh, during this pandemic, uh, COVID-19, and even our village head is hoping that UTHM will able to assist the community uh, in his in his village inshallah so uh, so now uh, we come to the presentation by our four guest speakers and uh, as a reminder to all speakers uh, each speaker will be allocated 10 minutes of presentation time and uh, don't worry i will give you a reminder uh, when the 10 minutes is up and the first speaker for today will be Professor Dr. Dayang Hajah Zohrah Haji Sulaiman, who is the Vice Chancellor of University Technology Brunei. And um, let me read her bio data before I call her to do her presentation. Uh, Professor Dr. Dayang Hajah Zohrah Binti Haji Sulaiman began her career as a school teacher in 1988. A year later, she joined University Brunei Darussalam, UBD. <laughs> She obtained her PhD in genetics from the University of Southampton, United Kingdom in 1994. Professor Dr. Zohra was Deputy Vice Chancellor at UBD uh, when she joined University Technology Brunei, formerly known as Institute Technology Brunei, as Acting Vice Chancellor in November 2012. She was appointed as Vice Chancellor on 1st January 2015, she spearheaded the transformation agenda of University Technology Brunei to be amongst the best 10 universities of engineering and technology in Southeast Asia by 2018. So her uh, biodata is very long, so I will stop there. Uh, so, so, without further ado, I will call upon uh, Professor Dr. Dayang Hajazora to give your uh, speech. <laughs> Professor, can you unmute? We cannot hear your voice. Yeah, we still we still cannot hear your voice. I'm sorry. Can you hear? Ah, yes, we can hear you now. Okay. Okay. We can hear you now. Thank you very much. Please proceed, Professor. 
Ya, yeah, Profesor, uh, thank you Profesor Dr. Aziz. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alamin wassalatu wassalamu ala asyrafil anbiya wal mursalin sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi washabbi ajmain. Yang berbahagia Profesor Datuk TS Dr. Wahid Razali, Vice Chancellor of University Tun Hussein Oon Malaysia, distinguished guests, ladies and colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and a very good afternoon. First and foremost, I'm very delighted to be here today at the ATUNET Virtual University President Forum 2020 Series 2. I would like to thank ATUNET for the invitation and the opportunity to present and share with others on how University Technology Brunei or UTB has been coping and transitioning towards digital mobility and e-learning amid the COVID-19 pandemic. If I can just share my screen. Can, can you see the, uh, the screen? So that's basically the title of my, of my talk today, the impact of COVID-19 on higher education institutions, a case for University Technology Brunei. So this is just a very brief introduction for members who do not uh, know University Technology Brunei. And a, a little background on COVID-19 pandemic started in Brunei on the 9th of March 2020. And as the numbers escalated daily, the Ministry of Education, through the advice of the Ministry of Health, UTB had taken the precautionary measures in ensuring that the spread of COVID-19 was regulated and that the business continuity plan was activated. As the health, safety and well-being of the community is the university's top priority, the university had decided to suspend face-to-face -face teaching and learning from 16 March 2020. Since then, UTB had been utilizing its online educational platforms and other non-face-to-face -face delivery methods of teaching and learning. However, the university remained open and operational with appropriate measures to protect the health of the community. So this is our strategies, basically, uh, in which we have said that we activated our business continuity plan and later on our academic continuity plan and then communication. So what we do um, that we closely monitor the situation to ensure the best response to the needs and safety of staff and students. The business continuity plan included guidelines and precautionary measures to contain the spread of COVID-19. Some of the major action taken were, uh, firstly, we postponed all activities organized by UTB that involve gathering large number of people and public service. Then we ensure that the university is very clean, we disinfected the campus and its vicinity. And then we also perform checks on body temperature, providing face masks and hand sanitizer. Fourthly, we also exercise practicing social distancing and less interaction to limit unnecessary exposures. And then we also suspend all face-to-face -face teaching and learning activities in campus. So if you like, this is the academic continuity plan that we have, is to suspend all face-to-face -face teaching and learning. And then we transition to online instruction by a university model or other online platforms for all undergraduate and graduate classes. And then lastly, we convert all examination assessment to 100% coursework. So this meant that there was no campus examination held in the last semester. When I, I speak of last semester, this was between March and May of this year. So in another word, we have to actually quickly adopt and make necessary adjustment according to the changes during the period uh, to, 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 uh, during that period and to strategize well in ensuring that the university could continue to, to operate and still produce a high quality experience for both students and staff. So the, as mentioned before, that the digital mobility highlighted the shift in teaching and learning, especially in ensuring the effectiveness of e-learning. In UTB, remote construction instruction were communicated often, and students would be updated on any changes through the online and social media platform. And we also have students who are undergoing the experience plus, meaning that they are attached overseas 
And in fact, many host organizations abroad have taken similar measure in suspending face-to-face -face teaching and learning activities, as well as internship. As a result, we have to bring all our students from overseas coming back to Brunei. However, we continue to communicate with our partners in ensuring there is alternative assessment for our students. As for our staff well-being, what we do is to actually took up advice from the Prime Minister's office on implementing flexible working arrangement. Earlier in the impl implementation, the university had only a lot vulnerable staff, meaning that staff with underlying conditions such as heart failure, heart uh, diabetes, we'll, we do not allow them to work. But then after a while, we allow everybody to actually work from home on rotation basis. And this arrangement was actually impl implemented from 26 March until 27 June 2020. And we find that in our, our keynote addresses that the importance of community and we, sh we were shown a, a video on community, we actually were involved in donating to our frontliners by providing dry food as well as medical scrub. We also look at our disadvantaged students. There are disadvantaged students who do not have means uh, at their home to have internet communication. That is about 6.11% of the total student population. So what we do, we are also giving them a one-time financial support at the cost of Brunei dollars, $40 uh, for, for each student. So let us look at challenges and opportunities. In fact, you know, I, I'm sure you agree with me that COVID-19 pandemic challenged the readiness of a university as it was an unexpected crisis. UTB has to mitigate the psychological impact of COVID-19 on UTB community. Surely, you know, there were feelings of worry and, and unease during the stressful events that might build up the anxiety and stress among students and staff. In ensuring safety across all the UTB community, staff and students were urged to follow all the guidelines and procedures provided by our BCP team in ensuring safety across UTB community. We must also find the balance between online learning and blended learning. We ensure a successful engagement with students through online learning, producing a high quality experience for the students. Then we ensure the campus is ready to accept students under the new normal transitions. We actually have opportunities to conduct survey, survey on delivering online education platform usage of COVID-19 uh, crisis at UTB, in which uh, the students are very much uh, keen to, have to continue on blend, blended learning arrangement that is certain percentage of face-to-face -face and the remaining is going online. And it is also opportunity to promote creative learning method. And of course, you know, during this time, no uh, moderators from overseas, uh, local tenants that can come to UTB. So what we do is actually to help them online teaching, which is uh, appear to be much cheaper uh, compared to having them in campus. So that's opportunity for us. Now, let me touch on how do we prepare for recovery? We are actually now on the fourth stage of de-escalation and that already started on 27 July, 2020. So we already accept students in the new semester on 27 July, but again, we are being advised by the Ministry of Health on how many pers how many people are allowed at any one time now the mass gathering is only up to 100 people at any one time so we are doing blended learning via online and traditional face-to-face -face teaching examination will be conducted normally and we will have local field trips which will be will have a risk assessment in place and the rest is just uh, doing uh, the activity normally so i just have this one here this is just a timeline of our COVID 19 outbreak in brunei we form our business continuity uh, plan in on 21st february the 9 march is the first COVID 19 case in brunei mm -hmm. we suspend our teaching 16 march and then 27 july is when we start already to open our campus uh, yes professor is that 
uh, your slide is not huh? is not is not changing. Oh really? It's wrong. Yes, uh, it's, it's still on the on the first oh, slide. Oh really? Uh, yes. For, for for some reason, I'm I'm not I'm not very sure why. This is also not moving. It's just this one here. Yes, still on the first page. Which is as, as we are as we are seeing now, it's still on the first page. Yeah, that's very. It, I do not know how to control this. I might be so you cannot see my slides, is it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh dear. Can can you press the enable editing on the top? Enable. On the, on the top of the screen, there's an enable editing. The, there's a yellow line. Yellow there's, line. There's a yellow line on the top of the screen, and then there's, there's the word enable editing. Could you press that button? Use it, use the uh, use the cursor to press the enable editing. No, I, I cannot see the enable okay. editing. Oh. Still, this is still the same, the same thing. So uh, there is still you do you cannot see my slide. <laughs> yes, but oh, it's okay. Yeah. It's okay, Prof. Just just proceed. Just proceed. Uh, okay. Uh, I, my Isa cannot cannot. Can you do something about this? I'm actually in conclu uh, in closing. Actually, can you? They cannot see the the screen. Can you help? Sorry, I'm sorry about this. Okay. It's okay. Uh, okay. That's that's. Can you watch the? Uh, my 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 helper will help. <laughs> so can I just say on in closing? Because I'm I'm running out of time, professor. Uh, professor. Yes. Uh, <laughs> enable editing. Enable editing. Yes. See, young people can do all this. <laughs> uh, can you can you see now? Yes, we can see. Can you uh, change the slide? Yes. Yeah. Yes, we that's can see your slide a, now. Yeah. That's our strategies. <laughs> that's um, right. We can see yeah. now very clearly. Oh, okay. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so that's the challenges and opportunities. This is just a timeline of what's happening right now. From twenty first February, when we form our own business continuity plan, until twenty seven July, where we are now in the fourth de escalation phase. So hopefully, nothing happens in the community that we are just uh, uh, you know um, continue to open normally in october and we are also will be holding our normal convocation inshallah this is what our hope is so in con uh, in conclusion uh, it has an impact on the university but it also created rooms and opportunities for the university to grow its resilience when faced with the crisis Without a swift and clear decision making concerning the changes within the university, it would not have successfully executed the abrupt transformation to digital literacy. So we also look at the student performance. Overall, they were they did very well, you know, not having examination but rather coursework. And there were positive feedback from the students as well. And e-learning complement the direct teaching and learning process, although it could not replace it. And I mentioned about clear decision making had made the transition easier and there is also a strong support within the university community. So that I can conclude uh, with my with my talk. Thank you, Professor. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Dr. Dayang Hajazora for the for sharing us with us the experience uh, from University Technology Brunei. Very, very interesting uh, talk by by the Vice Chancellor of UTB. Uh, I just I can just point out a few points, which I think is very interesting to all of us, where UTB implemented 100% coursework uh, with yes. no final with no examination. So no. that that is very very interesting to yeah. and it's very it's good that you have, you share this with us because I know some universities are implementing this as well. Um, and uh, as well, you mentioned a few things like um, that you uh, will be implementing blended learning, which I guess mm. is a combination uh, with face-to-face uh, -face and also online teaching as well. So yes. I, think, I think that's a good idea, a good uh, example set by University of Energy Brunei to all of us. So thank you very much, uh, Professor, you, Professor Dr. Dayang thank Hajazara, Zara, for thank the, for the uh, uh, excellent uh, presentation today. Thank you, Professor. Okay, now we can go to the second speaker, <coughs> and uh, 
Uh, unfortunately, due to uh, unforeseen circumstances, uh, Miss Christine, who is supposed to be the presenter for the for the for for this uh, second uh, presentation, is unable to join us, uh, and we will be we will be presented by uh, his colleague, uh, sorry, her, her colleague, Datu Bruce Lim, who is the managing director of JD Mass uh, Commerce, which is a business partner of. JD.com Malaysia. So, uh, <coughs> just let me read uh, uh, Dr. Bruce uh, Lim's uh, biodata. Uh, Dr. Bruce Lim started his career as a lecturer in laws with teaching experience in Malaysia, Hong Kong, and Singapore. He was later promoted to be coordinator for the laws program and subsequently the program manager responsible for starting the popular University of South Wales Master in Business Administration in bracket USWMBA uh, program under the Postgraduate Centre for ATC Group of Colleges. He has also driven, he has also driven the expansion of the Bachelor of Laws program for ATC College overseas with collaboration with ITC College Singapore. Ling, Ling Nam University and Hong Kong Poly University in Hong Kong. So, uh, without any further ado, I would like to call upon Datuk Bruce Lee to give your presentation. Datuk, the floor is yours. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. <coughs> good afternoon. Actually, I'm Bruce Lim. So, I've got uh, 10 minutes. So this is very interesting um, uh, topic or theme that we have today. And I am fortunate enough to have uh, uh, experiences in both sides of the world. I started off as an academic. And then after that, I've got into uh, property development, uh, technical vocational education, and recently into cross-border uh, e-commerce. I've always been uh, very, very uh, close to the retail industry, having been with the Malaysia Retail Chain Association for eight years, six of them as their Deputy Secretary uh, General. And I also uh, retired last year as the Chairman of the Governing Committee for the uh, uh, Retail and F&B, Productivity Nexus under MPC, which is a, a body under the Ministry of International Trade and Industry. So recently, I have partnered with JD.com's uh, cross-border e-commerce uh, unit, which is called JD Worldwide. So I have to apologize that Mr. Uh, Christine Wong couldn't be with us because she's actually on a flight and uh, so couldn't get out of the plane uh, in China. So I'm here filling in for her. So I hope that I'm able to give you an insight from the uh, cross-border or the e-commerce aspect of the industry and what practices uh, or that we can share and we can learn from, you know, and adopt and adapt it in the education uh, industry. Just a little bit about JD.com. It is a Fortune 200 company. Recently, it ranked 104. Uh, it went up a few notches in the Fortune 500 pro, uh, uh, industry. It is uh, listed both in NASDAQ in the US and it had a second listing in Hong Kong uh, on the 18th of June this year. So it is China's largest e-commerce company. It's known as Jintong, right? In China, it's la China's largest e-commerce company with 80 nine billion US dollars in terms of e-commerce transactions in 2019. So why do we want to bring in JD.com and what insights or lessons that we can learn from JD? Well, if you look at JD's financial figures in the first three months, the first quarter of 2020, you find that, uh, well, why is it so significant? Because the first three months of 2020 is where China experienced uh, a major lockdown, you know, especially in Wuhan. And even if you look at their results being announced, even the first quarter results, there is a surge in terms of profit by 20.6%. 
and uh, accounting for 20.7 billion US dollars. So you find that e-commerce, you know, rather than being affected, actually uh, thrive in the time where there is a, a pandemic. And the same trend could be seen in 2004, where, you know, JD uh, became very, very popular during the SARS uh, outbreak in 2004. And now JD again has come to the fore by uh, through its e-commerce in 2020. Now, why is it uh, so popular and what can we learn from it? Because we know that we have always talked about e-commerce and I've always been in retail uh, in the traditional industry. So retail is all about people in the middle and uh, it comprises majority SME companies, small, medium enterprises. And you know that with SME companies, retailers, uh, we are faced with daily uh, firefighting, limited access to funds, and therefore uh, investments in technology, people development, innovation, often takes a, a back seat, you know, in, uh, right? Take, it's kept in the back burner, and right in the fall, it's always about uh, uh, meeting margins, uh, uh, you know, meeting very, very uh, high costs, uh, overheads, and so on and so forth. But everyone's talking about the rise of e-commerce, the rise of omni-channel, O2O, but no one actually took any action until the COVID-19 pandemic struck. And you find that everyone is left with no choice but to get onboard e-commerce. So you find that many, especially Malaysian companies, when what it will take them six months, 12 months to get into an e-commerce program, uh, most can even get into it in as short a period as two weeks and even a month. So how has an organization such as JD able to operate even in the middle of a lockdown? Uh, first, um, you find that JD has invested a lot of its technology into its own logistics. So if you visit JD's uh, warehouses, because it's not just an e-commerce company, it is also where they also do its own delivery. So e-commerce is just not about transacting and buying and selling online. It is also about keeping your goods in the warehouse picking up the goods from the warehouse and doing the last mile delivery straight to the customer because that really has an effect on customer experience. And JD has got many of these, what is known as unmanned warehouses. So if you're talking about industry 4.0, this is where you have got warehouses 24 meters high, you know, over a million square foot, and it's actually unmanned and it's dark because robots do not need lights. So you find that in the middle of a pandemic, these warehouses still operate. And number two, they have huge inventories. Number three, they use data technology. They are able to predict based on data, you know, what is required, what are the purchasing behaviors of customers during the first month of a pandemic, the second month of a pandemic, third month of a lockdown. So they know first month of a lockdown is always essentials. Second month of a lockdown, uh, you're going to get a lot of home uh, purchases for your home, home gyms and so on. Third month where you have a little bit of a more of a control MCO. Uh, that's where people go out, where there's a bit of recovery and you find that uh, there's a boost in terms of office supplies and things like that. So they are able to make very, very insightful uh, uh, discoveries about purchasing uh, patterns of its customers. And lastly, JD has uh, recently employed up to 260,000 people. So they have actually uh, provided a lot of jobs for uh, people who have lost jobs. So it's actually uh, generating the economy as well. So what are we doing with JD in Malaysia as well? In Malaysia, we have got 50 over Malaysian brands, Malaysian SME companies 
they are also affected. People are not buying in Malaysia. So we were thinking, what is the best way to pivot and transform these companies? And we say, let's go to the China market instead of selling to 30 million Malaysians. Let's explore looking into selling Malaysian products, bringing across the border, using JD Worldwide's uh, superior uh, cross-border freight and uh, e-commerce know-how. And let's go for the 1.3 billion population in China, of which 1 billion is registered with JD. So this is something we started in the middle of an MCO. The Malaysia, the Gap Malaysia. And that's where we started with Zoom sessions like that. We got hold, we have support from MDAC, we have got support from Martrade, we have got support from METI, from MPC. And that's how we got a few of these Malaysian merchants to come together and we make them cross-border e-commerce ready. And in order to do this, uh, I think there were some themes that were shared by earlier speakers like uh, Professor Dr. Zora uh, about mindset change. So that's very, very important. And it's quite easy to do mindset change nowadays because all of us are hit with this pandemic. We've got no choice but to change our mindset. Previously, it's different because there's always this, uh, uh, we are quite complacent with what we have and now uh, it has shaken us right to our foundation. So this is a great time to approach uh, Malaysian uh, merchants, Malaysian businessmen, Malaysian SMEs for this mindset change and look into a growth mindset. You know, think of innovation, think of technology, think of branding, think of value that you can put into your brand and so on. Uh, classic examples, we have got someone who sells tudong, okay, or scarves for 165 ringgit in Malaysia landed. But when we did our research, we found that that scarf can go for as high as a thousand renminbi in China. So these are examples of packaging, in terms of branding, in terms of uh, other means of getting value. So this is great. So it's not just a mindset of growth, branding. We also teach them how to go live using technology. Those days when we talk about digital marketing, it's just about landing pages and all. Right now, we are all on live on Zoom. We are live on Facebook, but in China, they don't have Facebook. So they have got their JD Live, JD Mission, they, they have affiliate marketings with like Quiso uh, and, and so on and so forth. That's where we teach our merchants to engage their B2C customers live in China. And this is a tremendous experience for us to reach out to huge markets. So these are examples of how we try to help uh, Malaysian companies pivot and transform yeah, company. So right now we have got 53 companies. We are going to launch Sempena Hari Malaysia in September. And we are going to do a launch direct straight to China live. And we are going to prepare getting our products on testing, on sampling to China. It's all being sent over. We take care because most Malaysian SMEs, they are not aware of how to take your goods over overseas. So we settle warehousing in Malaysia here cross-border freight, customs clearance, getting to a bonded warehouse in China, uh, last mile logistics, e-payment systems, reports, business intelligence. And this has been an, an absolutely wonderful journey that we have with our, our merchants. And, uh, and, and this is still a work in progress as we launch in Makhari, Malaysia. So hopefully we'll be able to see the results of what we want to do because at the end of the day, everything depends on results. And we are all targeting the singles day sales in um, November. So that will be the uh, one of China's largest e-commerce campaign that's going to take place on the 11th of November. Yeah, so we are all very, very pumped up, very, very excited. The data through sampling of Malaysian products in China has been excellent. We have got great advisors. Uh, I'd like to thank Martin Ang. Martin is my advisor. He's also a director of Julie's Biscuit. So give you an idea of how big Julie's is. They have started their e-commerce journey a little more than five years ago. And today they are doing 100 million 
Raminpi every year just on e-commerce alone and just going live over seven minutes, they can make one million sales. So that's the power of cross-border e-commerce. We also work very closely with Julie's and Martin's team. And then we know in China right now, there's an, we are very lucky, very fortunate because there's a heightened awareness of Malaysia and Peranakan culture, Baba and Nyonya. There's a show called The Little Nyonya. 45 episode that is shown on iQiyi, which is the YouTube, uh, I wouldn't say the YouTube, the Netflix of China. And uh, it has got 600 million viewers. And uh, everyone is now very curious about Malaysian culture, uh, which fuses the Malay uh, culture, the Chinese culture, Indian and the Western culture. And, and it's quite interesting. I urge if you want to watch it, you can. I watched it and it's quite interesting seeing China actors and actresses berpantun dalam bahasa Melayu. Okay, <laughs> so that's quite interesting. So with this renewed interest, we intend to launch it next year and hopefully uh, that will put Malaysia on uh, China's map when it comes to cross-border e-commerce because this thing can happen. Uh, JD is big and uh, we can ride on it and hopefully that brings uh, some success for us. In terms of virtual online learning, can we sell it to China? Uh, online learning can be sold in China, but right now they have not opened it to cross border yet. The moment it's open, then we probably can sell Malaysian courses from Malaysian universities to China via cross border. But that time has not come yet. Right now we are still limited to uh, products uh, under uh, this existing JD categories. All right. so. Wish us all the best. It's been a pleasure sharing with all of you. Thank you very much. Back to you, Prof. Thank you very much, Dr. Bruce, for a very excellent presentation. Uh, no slides, just, just words, which, which means a lot. So, uh, yes, you did give us a very strong presentation today, uh, highlighting the success of JD.com in China and as well as in Malaysia, and, uh, and, and able to employ 260,000 people is a very excellent uh, achievement by JD.com. So I'm sure uh, there will be, I'm sure JD.com can share with us more uh, with their experiences with regards to using the various technology that you have employed in ensuring that e-commerce is, uh, uh, is conducted successfully. So, so again, I'd like to thank uh, uh, Dato Bruce Lim for sharing the uh, uh, for sharing JD.com's success, and hopefully we can learn from you uh, in the very near future. So I think we will now proceed uh, to the uh, third presenter. Okay, the third presenter will be Professor Chun Fai Leong, who is the president of the International Press in Association Japan. So. Before I ask Professor Leung to proceed with his presentation, just let me read his biodata. So Professor Leung Chun Fai is a professor in the Department of Civil Engineering at the, at the National University of Singapore. He has been a staff member of the, of the department since April 1981. Professor Leung graduated from the University of Liverpool with a bachelor's in engineering in 1977 and achieved his PhD and obtained his PhD in 1981. His PhD research topic is on centrifuge model study of vertical anchors. So without further ado, I would like to invite Professor Leung Chun Fai to give his presentation. Professor Leung. Thank you. I hope all of you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you. To, Thank you. Yeah, we can hear you. I would you. like to share my screen and uh, make a short presentation. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can just see your screen. Yeah. Can you can you enlarge the? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Okay. So uh, we have. Uh, uh, thank you for the organizer to inviting me uh, to take part in the capacity of the president of the IPA, International Press In Association, which I take over as a president in June. And actually, I'd like to introduce in the audience uh, Dr. Azizi 
uh, a uh, faculty member from uh, UTHM. He is the current, a current vice president of the association. So we have a quite strong presence here. So we have speaker from the government ministry, from two university, and uh, one from the uh, e-commerce, cross-border e-commerce. And now let me share experience from the academic institution viewpoint. So, but uh, not many of you would uh, uh, know much about that. So I would uh, need to introduce a few slides on the IPA. But the main presentation today will be looking at the academic resilience for IPA, right? Which I would like to bring out uh, several points. Actually, uh, as the uh, last speaker, uh, all the previous speaker have done a good job, and uh, I, we, whatever I say, may be repeating many of them. But I would like to take this opportunity to highlight that uh, there are two key points uh, we have actually spoken by the previous speakers. And I would like to use IPA example to highlight to you. So the first, the plus in technology is to uh, install retaining structures for temporary excavation for special situations such as very close to existing building, very low headroom, and uh, it has less noisy and less vibration. We have hundreds of such machines worldwide and over 70 in Singapore, and uh, there is quite a number in Malaysia also. So like this photograph showing a Singapore project, right? it has very close to the adjacent buildings, so noise and vibration is a concern. And the next picture shows you that we need to do excavation. Typically, this will be the construction of drains, which were just essentially next to the building. We need to widen the drain to improve the drainage work. So this uh, press in machine would be the only one we can use it. So very quickly uh, to promote this technology, press in engineering, essentially a multidisciplinary field, geotechnical, construction, mechanical, even electrical in terms of control. So in view of this, uh, association was formed about 13 years ago in Cambridge University. So the founder president is Professor Malcolm Bolton from Cambridge University. And uh, uh, immediate past president is Professor Osamu Kusakabe from Japan. So I just take over, as I mentioned earlier in June, he has over 700 individual members worldwide. And more important, the commercial participation, we have 55 members. So, so far, we have been publishing the handbook on press in technology. And the first edition is in Japanese and we have translated into English. And now we are looking for a publisher for the second edition of the English version. So we are also publishing the quarterly uh, newsletter. And you can see if as an academic association, exchange of the technology is important as highlighted in these five technical committee to interchange and promote the press in uh, technology. So not only that, we have a very large conference, over 300 people attending the first international conference on press in engineering uh, about two years uh, ago. And we have also uh, many seminars. For example, there's one held in Malaysia Kuala Lumpur in 2017, which was very successful, over 100 uh, participants. And we have also these uh, uh, press in engineering uh, uh, seminars, while we have these also hold in the international workshop all over the world. So these are, are the highlight of the activities. So I'd like to highlight why right, everybody know about the challenges, for example, Every year we have the board of director meeting. So in June, we cannot hold it because of the COVID-19. We have to do it in correspondence because we can't do it online meeting because our board members are from all over the world, from Europe, from America, and from Asia. There's no common time. And we are actually scheduled to have an IPA technical seminar 
in Jakarta and Taipei in March, and it has to be postponed next year. But even at this stage, it is not uh, uh, well. It's certain. So there are quite a lot of challenges. There are technical committee meetings have to go online rather than face to face plus online. Now, so our next major event is a second international conference on press in engineering in June in Kochi in Japan. Now, so you can see that it has been affected and the call for abstract has to be extended and we still face uncertainty. We do not know whether by June 2021, the COVID-19 is over or not. So, so now how do we uh, maintain right, and following the academic resilience? So we believe that the newsletter is the most important link and we are now already have the Zoom meeting between myself and the uh, uh, secretary in the headquarter in Tokyo. So we are going to expand this to the various level and to uh, look at that. And we believe that the publication of the handbook in different languages would also be important to promote, uh, to maintain the academic uh, resilience. So we're talking about the second conference what we have planned, you have to be in addition to face-to-face, uh, -face, we have looked at the online option. Of course, when the matter getting even worse, then we could only have the online event, which is like happened today. Now, what my first message to the audience is that I would like to use our, uh, uh, the Malaysian Minister of Higher Education Right. She put up three important keywords, planning. Obviously, we need to look at planning. And not only that, we need to be uh, adaptive right? by looking at things. So you see that every day, the uh, circumstances, the conditions are changing. So we need to adopt before we apply. But even the whole process, planning, adopt, apply, is keep on changing. So every day we are on the toe, on our toe, and we will uh, uh, keep changing. But you can see from the present development that I think human beings are very clever. I'm very, I'm very sure that in the near future we will master the uh, the situation and make it uh, what we call successful and not much. They will be different from before, but in terms of the uh, communication process, right? not only that we can maintain, I think we will be getting better. So that's why I come to my concluding uh, remark. As I say, we need to adopt and adapt. Now, what I find is from my experience with other organizations, such as one I'm heavily involved with is the Geotechnical Society of Singapore. So they have actually joined hand with the Malaysian Geotechnical Society, Hong Kong Geotechnical Society, and we have formed a Zoom seminars. And we find that now actually, not only it will, uh, uh, that it will provide us great opportunity, right? As uh, our previous speaker mentioned, right? Uh, our uh, Vice Chancellor from UTB and our uh, uh, Mr. Lim on, from the JDCom on looking on all these things and they definitely to be not only that we can maintain, we can actually expand because now online activity, there are actually no boundary. So using the John uh, Geotechnical Seminars between Singapore, Malaysia and Hong, Hong Kong, and actually, we have very strong audience. And every time this joint seminar would have a few hundred participants and they are getting more and more popular. So therefore, I think we should not be feel uh, bad. And actually, this provides us, although it provides us challenges, it also provides us new horizon and under the new normal situation. So I would like to share with you from the academic viewpoint. Thank you for your kind attention and uh, thank you very much.
for paying attention. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Leong, for your excellent presentation. Uh, again, uh, we've, uh, this afternoon we have listened to uh, another view from the industry about how we can build academic resilience. And, uh, and, you, are, and you have rightly said, uh, Professor Leung, about three key words uh, mm -hmm. mentioned by the Minister, which is to plan, to adapt and to apply. And of course, you are right in saying again that all these three key words will have to change according with the time and the circumstances that we face. And uh, again, I'd like to say thank you very much, Professor Leung, for a well uh, thoughtful and uh, good uh, presentation. Thank you very much. So now uh, let us proceed with the uh, fourth uh, and final speaker in this session. Uh, the fourth and final speaker will be Professor Dr. Ismail Abdurrahman, the Deputy Vice Chancellor, uh, Academic and International from University Tun Hussein on Malaysia. And again, I will read his biodata before I allow him to uh, proceed with his presentation. So, uh, Professor Dr. Ismail Abdurrahman completed his undergraduate study in civil engineering from University Technology Malaysia, UTM. He then pursued his MS, uh, MSc in building services engineering at uh, Herod Ward University, Edinburgh, and finally obtained his PhD in building engineering from the University of Manchester, UK. He is he is a professor in civil engineering at the Faculty of Civil and Environmental Engineering, UTHM. In uh, 2018, Professor Dr. Ismail was appointed as the Deputy Vice Chancellor of Academic and International at University Tun Hussein on Malaysia until today. So, without any further uh, delay, I would like to call upon Professor Dr. Ismail Abdul Rahman to proceed with his presentation. Prof. Okay. The floor is yours. Okay. Thank you, Professor Aziz. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. And uh, good, uh, good afternoon and good evening. So basically, I would like to share my presentation on uh, sharing the experience on handling the teachings and learnings uh, during and after COVID-19 pandemic. So basically, I have around uh, four slides. So the first slide is about the planning of teachings and learning, deli the le delivery for uh, during the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, and the second slide will be the the executions of the planning of the distant learning, and the third one, uh, sharing with the issues faced by the student and also the uh, lecturers uh, in implementing the new normal of uh, teaching and learning, and finally. Uh, sharing the uh, continuous assessment and improvement uh, toward the teaching and learning in UTHM. Next slide, please. So, uh, during the lockdown, uh, we, are, uh, we have to plan on how to carry, carry out or conduct a new norm uh, in delivery of teaching and learning. So, we have to find the right way, the right method that will fit uh, UTHM okay in the delivering the teaching and learning to our student so we have to uh, we have we we analyze uh, the pro and con in delivering the uh, teachings and learning in the new normal so we have to do the assessment we have to know what is the 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 the, the, the hindrance that if we want to uh, carry out or conduct uh, full online uh, learning so after we make the assessment, we found out that if we want to do a full online learning, there's a lot of difficulties, especially then, uh, especially when our student, majority of our students are under, under they call it uh, B40, below, uh, below 40 income groups. So it is about the affordability on getting uh, the internet, so that is why, and finally, we come out with so-called the distant learning, whereby in this distant learning, we uh, blend the delivery of the teaching and learning uh, uh, in a two mode. They call it a synchronized and asynchronized uh, approach. So basically, um, 
the, we, 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 when we deliver the so-called distant learning, uh, two important factors are considered. The first one, we have to consider the student accessibility to the uh, distant learning. And second one is about the quality, the quality of the delivery. So in terms of the quality of delivery, we are focusing on the, uh, the achievement of the CLO, that is a cost learning outcome. And also, according to the student learning time, these are the two criteria that is uh, governed the quality of the delivery of the teaching and learning. So we have to, we, we do the engagement with the, the, the lecturer, we do the engagement with the students, uh, student body, uh, look uh, with their opinions, okay, Get, getting their opinion before we formulate uh, the, the planning and the, uh, the teaching and uh, planning delivery in UTHM. Next slide, please. Now, <clears throat> when we do the distant learning, we have to understand uh, the, the, the present, I mean face-to-face, -face, the conventional method of delivery and how we transform, migrate from the face-to-face -face delivery into a distant learning. So we have to do some articulation in, in terms of the delivery so what are the subject, what are the uh, subject that can be delivered online and what are the subject that is can't be delivered online. So what are the alternatives that we have? So we have to consider all these aspects and then uh, uh, discussion, a lot of discussions have been engaged with the faculty's members and also the lecturers together with the student. So we uh, formulate a uh, trial delivery of distance learning for two weeks before we implement the exact delivery of the teaching and learning through distance learning. So within that, we also do the survey to assess, assess uh, whether the, the, the delivery uh, according to what we have planned. So uh, during the trial period, because this is a new way, new, new way of delivery, uh, there's a lot of uh, hiccup, especially on the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the teaching uh, contents and the readiness, the readiness on the uh, student and also the lecturer. So I have to mobilize, I have to mo mobilize the unit on the global learning unit and also the uh, uh, quality control uh, uh, CAD, they call it Center for uh, Curriculum Development. So we, we, with these two body, they are looking on the, the quality of the delivery and also the method of the delivery. We formulate a new breed of uh, a delivery uh, to ensure that uh, with all the constraint is taken care during the delivery of the teaching and learning. Uh, we do some survey to assess, uh, assess like uh, we do survey on the 15 April uh, by the student representative and also from the uh, global center of UTHM to, to see what is happening on the ground, to get the perceptions uh, from the student and also from the perspective of the lecturer. Okay, next please. Now these are the example of issue faced by the student. Uh, for instance, the student face a new new type of distance learning. They are, they are uh, new. Uh, their, their student react in a different manner because they are staying in the, at home. Some of their homes are conducive for distance learning, while others may be the other way around. So these are the thing they are having a problem of the uh, the internet uh, reach out the quality and the reliability of the internet, that's another issue. So they need to shift their, their paradigm of thinking. If they are still uh, maintain, uh, they are complacent with their conventional method, okay, they are reluctant to move to uh, uh, on the online teaching, so they, are, they, they may cannot uh, accept the new, new type of uh, delivery. And then the conditiveness, and the infrastructures, these are important things. 
and the student uh, they call it a B40 student they, uh, they, they don't have their internet connection to their house in terms of the lecturer the issue that they face are not enough material for the distance learning okay and they are, they are some of the lecturers are not really uh, competent they are, they are not that competent enough uh, to conduct the lecture uh, online so and also the readiness in delivery the uh, online so in terms of the faculty they are they are having the difficulties of recording the student attendance and some of the students are missing in action so how to handle this so we have to look on the uh, the top management role these are the some of the uh, I'm just giving the general descriptions the the the, the stepwise that what we have done to handle all this issue is about the, the top management role. We do a lot of uh, meeting, uh, looking on the way to improve this uh, online learning. And then we have to the empower, empower the faculties, the, the deans to, to, to ensure that the delivery of the uh, teaching and learning at the ground are uh, what we have been planned. And then uh, we also educate and provide training for our uh, lecturers, especially on the delivery online uh, and also, um, also on the contents of the online. And then we also motivate the staff. Uh, then we uh, practice uh, flexibility, okay, uh, flexibility at this uh, under the circumstances, a uh, very tense circumstances on delivery so flexibility is very important then we have to do a lot of uh, communication and engagement so we also engage with the telco the provider to ensure that uh, it helps our student because our student is all over Malaysia okay next please so these are the a few of the finding the finding that we got from the our survey so, uh, survey about the distance learning. Uh, so, basically, what I can uh, generalize from this uh, finding that 80% uh, of our student, 81% of our student attend the class, okay, according to the lecturer. Only around 18 are missing, uh, or they, they be, cannot be traced. And then about the lecturer readiness, about 76% of the lecturers are ready and 22 are less ready and 2 are not ready. So with all this data, we have to rectify. Okay? We, we do training, we do the engagement to the respective lecturers and also to the students. We have to do the micromanaging to the individual uh, lecturers and also to the individual uh, uh, students. And we also found out that uh, the student, uh, they are in terms of the examinations, okay, are they ready or not ready? So from the perspective of the student, so basically 71% are not ready. The, this is common for the student, for not ready for the examination. Even, <laughs> even if it is delivered face to face, they will say that they are not ready. So we, 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 we have to look on the broader uh, uh, perspective. So the, the, with this all the, 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 the result of the survey, so we have to analyze and we have to uh, keep on changing the method and the de delivery. And uh, what, I can, uh, where, what I can share is that uh, the assessment will be different. So the, the assessment that we, uh, we give to the student is different as uh, for the face-to-face -face, uh, teaching and uh, uh, learning as compared to the online learning because uh, we, 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 we can't avoid that uh, the, the test and examination to be uh, you know under under one roof and a controlled environment but in this case you know the, the student the tendency that they are copying each other so what we did is that we have to set a question that is more on application rather than a, a question that is on memorizing. So that, that would be a good way 
of uh, uh, making our student more on the problem solving rather than more on the retention of the facts and figure. So that, that will be, uh, I think, uh, hopefully, with this uh, method, the student is more capable in solving the problem rather than memorizing uh, the fact. So I think uh, uh, that will be uh, my talk for this afternoon. Maybe if there is a Q&A, then uh, uh, more sharing will be, you know, I'm willing to share more on the, uh, the teaching and the learning uh, that we experience in UTHM. Okay, I'll give it back to Okay, thank you very much, uh, Prof. Ismail, for an excellent uh, presentation, uh, basically sharing the experiences of how UTHM uh, overcome teaching and learning in this uh, COVID-19 pandemic. So, uh, uh, well, uh, I was one of the lecturers as well who had to go through the process of uh, adopting and adapting with the new uh, system, with the new arrangement. So I can have to say, I have to say that uh, it has been a good experience for all of us. It has been a good experience, and I'm sure all the lecturers that has gone through the process has benefited from all these changes that has been enforced uh, on upon all of us. So so I believe that the, all the lecturers are very pleased uh, with what they have done so far. But of course. Of course, they would have. They would prefer. They were hoping to do to do better, to do better. But then again, it all depends on the the system that we have, the technology that we have, the ability of the academic staff to adopt and adapt, and as well. And finally, the students themselves must also be able to uh, adopt and adapt with the new situation. Right. So thank you very much, uh, Prof. Uh, Ismail Abdurrahman. It has been good uh, that you share with us, to all of us, about how UTHM. Uh, went through the process of teaching and learning during this COVID-19 pandemic. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we have listened to four speakers, two speakers from the academia and two speakers from the industry. So, and I think uh, all four speakers have done an excellent uh, job this afternoon. They've shared with us uh, all the experiences that they had uh, and they have uh, really outlined to all of us uh, about how we can build this, the, build the academic resilience in this post-COVID-19 uh, world. So I'm sure there will be questions uh, that uh, viewers would like to ask our speakers. Now, I have to say that time is not very kind to all of us now. We've, gone, we've, we've, uh, we've just gone beyond 4.30 p.m. And then, um, so what I will do is I will allow uh, questions to be asked, uh, and depending on the uh, on the <laughs> on the responses by the speakers, uh, we'll see how how many questions that I will allow to be forwarded to speakers. So for uh, for the time being, I would like to uh, allow uh, first speaker, uh, first question to be forwarded to the speakers. Assalamualaikum. Waalaikum salam. Please uh, tell us your name. I am Salam Mustafa, lecturer uh, in FSKTM UTHM. Okay. Uh, I would I would like to thank the speakers for their uh, information about the post uh, uh, COVID nineteen uh, and the possible arrangement uh, to improve our performance. Uh, in the future, uh, my question to to the presenters, uh, especially Prof. Uh, Dr. Ismail, is the academy uh, academician, and I am one of them, uh, were struggling in maintaining the performance while achieving their KPI during the COVID-19. So, uh, based on this experience, uh, what uh, are the best post-COVID skills that should be obtained by the academicians to facilitate the teaching and learning process for the next semester and the coming years? Okay, thank you very much for the question. So, Prof. Ismail, 
<laughs> this question is for you. Okay, okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Salama, is it? Dr. Salama, is it? The name is Salama. Okay. okay. Thank you, Dr. Salama. Okay. Basically, uh, we, 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 we are a lecturer. We have a lot of uh, tasks. I think, I believe that we have to do the teaching, uh, teaching, and then we have to write paper, do research, do the services, everything. So we, we are juggling with all the, 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 the KPIs and so on and so forth. But I believe that, uh, as has been mentioned by the previous uh, speaker, it's about the resilience that we, we have. Hopefully, with all the hardship that we have undergone uh, during this uh, COVID, uh, will make us a better lecturer uh, in future because we have gone through the so-called the, the, the adapt and adapted, uh, the adapt and <laughs> adaptability uh, in, in confronting uh, the COVID issue. And, uh, you know, during the COVID issue, we have to, uh, at the same time, uh, yeah, the difficulty. Be because this, uh, the COVID, the pandemic is unprecedented uh, occasion where we are, we are actually, everybody is not ready. You know, it's, it's, <laughs> we are not ready uh, uh, to face these uh, uh, circumstances. So I think uh, with all, if we have gone through this uh, COVID-19, we will, much better uh, with all the uh, with all the the, 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 the the values that been induced during this uh, COVID-19. Uh, I, I, I don't see any 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 problem uh, for 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 the lecturer to to be a better uh, uh, you know they can perform much better. It, it's just a matter of. Uh, you, you can't you can't be a superman. You can do everything at one time. So maybe uh, certain aspect you may be uh, a little bit loose, where the other aspect will be you should strengthen it. So basically, as a whole, I think uh, uh, with all the the the, the, the self management during the COVID, I think uh, when you do the when you conduct the teaching and learning uh, through online, you have to be self motivated, self disciplined. So these are the value that induce during the period of COVID. Then then I believe that if you maintain this sort of uh, uh, positive value, okay, is carried out after the COVID. So you can be a better, better person. So there is no, uh, you know, there's no, uh, uh, there's no, Panadol can solve all the, uh, <laughs> the problems. So we, we have to, uh, to be smart in uh, uh, do, uh, dealing with all this uh, issue. I think that that's, that's my, uh, my response to the question. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Professor Mel. Uh, Can I have the, the second question, Professor? Okay. I was the one who was up of a while ago. Okay, uh, yes, uh, yes, madam. Uh, please, uh, can you uh, just tell us uh, your name and then uh, where, where you are from? And then please, could you just uh, uh, tell us the question is to whom? To which speaker? Okay. Thank you very much. So I am, I am Professor Milagros Baldemore from the Don Mariano Marcos Memorial State University, Philippines. So I am the former Dean of the College of Graduate Studies. So uh, may I ask the question to Professor Raman? Yeah. Yes, proceed, please. Yeah. So being an academician, I am always for quality education. So I am from a developing country and as much as I wanted to, we always encounter problems in the implementation of online instruction. So we send uh, teachers or lecturers to seminars. We use instructional materials and varied educational methodologies and strategies. Yeah. However, uh, our problem here is on the part of the tertiary students where, because we are in a developing country, some students do not even have Android phones they don't have laptops and signals are very difficult in their places. Yeah. So still we believe in blended learning, yeah. but uh, as much as possible, we limit face-to-face -face yeah. classes this time. 
So I know uh, Malaysia is far better in terms of internet connections compared to the Philippines. Mm -hmm. But with this scenario, uh, can you give us recommendations on how to solve this problem? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Madam. Uh, so basically, uh, you see, during, the, during the lockdown, uh, during the lockdown period, when we conduct uh, teaching and learning, so our student is, uh, they are staying at home. They are uh, all over in Malaysia. So some part of Malaysia also having the problem of internet connection. That is why we, we adopt uh, a system, or they call it uh, distant learning. We, we, don't, we don't say that uh, our, we deliver our teaching and learning through online. Because if it is online, it must be through uh, real-time uh, delivery. So we, we adopt a system they call a distant learning. So in distant learning, so we have to make do with several modes. See, uh, we are doing the uh, synchronized and insynchronized uh, approach, whereby we also use the through email, through phone, and to the, ext uh, to the extreme, we send it through post and courier services to, to, to our, our student. So we will try to make sure that because I have directed the lecturer that they have to, the, 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 the important thing, the student uh, accessibility to the teaching and learning. This, this is the, 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 more, uh, the, the most important thing. So, uh, so if, the, uh, if the student, okay, if they cannot get the mode uh, through online learning, online uh, uh, teaching and learning, they, they, then they, they can it through phone, and the, the other mode of delivery. So, so it, it just we have to make do whatever, whatever we can do to engage the student to make sure that the student is not left out. Any of the student is not. So we are having around uh, 16,000 16, students, 16,000 students undergraduate. We will make sure that every student, we, we engage every student to make sure that all the material stuff is delivered to them. So we have to make all, you know, they, they, these are the, the thing. It is not only in Philippines, even in Malaysia, over having the problem of internet co connections. Uh, but we have to do different mode of uh, connecting our students. That I can say that uh, the, the, the hustle that we have gone through in the delivery of uh, teaching and learning. Alhamdulillah, uh, I'm very grateful to the uh, lecturer of UTHM. They are willing to work together. I think that the best thing is that to do a lot of engagement. Engagement with the lecturer, okay. Uh, uh, get the, 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 the participation from the lecturer uh, with their, you know, uh, their willingness is about the willingness and also get the engagement with the student body. So they will, they will engage within the student and within the lecturer. So if they are, everybody is happy uh, while doing this difficult, under difficult situa situation, then uh, thing will be, you know, uh, it, it can help a lot. So it's, it is more on, um, I don't, don't really practice or, uh, you know, just um, putting a cane, something like that. <laughs> but, but it's more on uh, <laughs> engaging, uh, make them believe that this is the, the, old, this is the way, uh, way forward. And I think on the, the, the silver lining of this convict um, uh, 19, will be it expedites you know, the teaching of learning uh, for the future. This is going to be a way forward for the U2HM to, 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 to be at a global, uh, to, to be one of the global player in delivery of uh, uh, teaching and, and, and learning, hopefully. So there, there, there's no, that's why I say there's no one method. So in, even in the coming semester, I'm adopting, I call it a hybrid uh, approach whereby uh, partly will be uh, conduct through face-to-face -face and partly will be conduct through uh, so-called distant learning or online approach.
So we 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 don't have the right. Um, we cannot be very rigid uh, in in any formula because the 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 the, the variability and the, the the parameter is keep on changing. So the best thing is that we have the framework. So what I did, I have the framework of uh, teaching and learning, and also the assessment. And then with this framework, I give it to the faculty. The faculty will do the micro uh, managing to the student. And any problem, they will bring back to me. Then I have to rede redesign at the, the drawing board and then put it back. So it is to and fro. The system is to and fro. So Flexible. because there's a looking on at the, 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 the actual delivery on the ground, there's a lot of uh, obstacles. There's a lot of problem. So that is why we, uh, we, we have to do that, that sort of uh, and, uh, that sort of approach. Okay, I'll give it to the, sorry. <laughs> okay, okay, thank you very much, Professor. Thank you. Okay, thank you, thank you uh, Prof. Ismail. Thank you, Professor, for, for asking the question. So yeah. I hope, I hope uh, you have uh, managed to uh, grab the idea that yes. uh, what Professor has been uh, mentioning just now. So yes, thank I you. Did, so thank you okay. very much. All right. So, uh, friends and colleagues, I think uh, we are unable to continue with the question and answer session. Time is so precious now. And uh, we will now come to the uh, end of this uh, event. But before that, uh, ATU Net would like to announce the official launch of the ATU Net Online Global Classroom or ATU Net OGC. So there will be a video presentation. So please watch and enjoy the video presentation. The new norm presents us with opportunities to reinvent new model of learning and campus experience for students so that students are able to not only survive but thrive and flourish. The ATUNet Online Global Classroom or ATUNet OTC is one of the initiatives by the smart partnership of ATUNet. It is a new study model that could engage students from various parts of the world to meet in one place anywhere and anytime. The students will be able to assess education delivered by international educators. I would like to invite all universities to become part of this initiative. And I wish all a fruitful and meaningful exchange of ideas in the ATUNet UPF 2020. Thank you very much, uh, Dato Professor IR Dr. Wahid Omar, being the chair of ATU Net for officially launching the ATU Net OGC. So this is this ATU Net OGC basically opens up doors for learning, sharing, and networking, connecting learners across Asia and beyond. So I hope everyone watching will share this information to your colleagues using this new tool to stay connected. Now, for any further information with regards to ATU Net OGC, viewers can proceed to the ATU Net website. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, friends and colleagues, we have come to the very end of the uh, session. And uh, before I end the session, I just like to give two reminders. I was asked to give you to these two reminders to all of, to all of us. Firstly, with regards to the slides, because there were many of the viewers and audience participants were re requesting the slides to be provided. And this has been promised by the organizers that all the slides will be available in FB UTHM, Facebook, UTHM Facebook. So please go to FB UTHM and you will be able to obtain the slides in there. And secondly, 
uh, before we end the session, okay, and we will have a group photo. So all viewers who are in Zoom, please, uh, when I uh, request all of you, please open up your, your Zoom windows and show your faces because we would like to take a group photo of all of, all of us and we will put that in our website. So, uh, so these are the two things that I request uh, that I would like to deliver to all of you to remind you. Again, don't forget, a group photo before we end the, the, this session. So as a, as a reminder to all of us again, um, okay, all Zoom viewers, eh, please do not leave just yet. You are invited to have an engagement session with the Vice Chancellor of University Tunisian on Malaysia. And this session will come shortly after this. So before that, we will have this group photo. So please, everybody, please open up your Zoom windows. Please show your faces so that we can see all of you. because we will be taking a group photo. Yeah, there's a lot more who, are, who is yet to open the, their windows. Don't worry, don't worry about how you look like. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> All right, is this, is this okay? Or still, there's some more, they're still not yet. Okay, so what's the situation? Are we, are we okay? Can we proceed with the group photo now? Oh, it's done. Okay, oh. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't know that. So it's done. Thank you very much, everybody. So, so we've come to the end of the session. I have to say thank you very much to everybody, everybody who has been with us for this two hours plus. Uh, in this session, I must thank my Vice Chancellor, Dato Wahid Razali, and also my Deputy Vice Chancellor, Professor Ismail Rahman, who has been with us since uh, this afternoon uh, until today. So, uh, and also to all my friends and colleagues who are uh, in front of me now, all of them are here. All of them are all uh, with us, and without them, this session would not have been conducted successfully. So with that, I thank you again, and don't forget, we'll have an engagement session with our Vice Chancellor and Deputy Vice Chancellor. So with that, I would like to say goodbye, and all the best from us to all of you. So, goodbye, and we hope to see you again. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Bye.